This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again. It is time for Mises Weekends. This week I'm joined by a friend, Daniel McAdams, someone whom I've known, gosh, since the early 2000s, someone with whom I worked in Dr. Paul's congressional office in Washington, D.C. For any of you who aren't familiar with Daniel, he runs the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. And along with a couple of real luminaries, uh, I would list him in, you know, amongst the one or two top uh, libertarian foreign policy people we have out there working. So with that, Daniel, good to see you. Welcome. Hey, Jeff. Thanks for having me back on Mises Weekends. Well, so we are talking about the financial costs of war this week. And I, and I notice I say war, not defense, because I think this is all part and parcel of how language tends to shape our thinking about this stuff. And, and I noticed, I didn't realize this, but um, we actually you called the Department of Defense, so-called, uh, the Department of War up until after w World War II. It wasn't until 1949 that, it, that it, it happened in stages that we fully started using the term Department of Defense. I, for some reason, I had it in my mind that that was earlier. Yeah, and I guess that was the, the last time we declared war, too. So it makes yeah. sense that they stopped calling it the Department of War. Yeah, well, <laughs> the euphemisms. you know, George Orwell had that faming, famous uh, essay about meaningless words in politics. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how it would shape, shape our perception if, for instance, if we called Mattis uh, the Secretary of War. Because yeah. these wars, we don't even think of the United States as being at war. The, the popular culture, we don't think of this, in, even as we did in Vietnam, but certainly not in World War II, which was a, a concerted national effort. Well, it's a lot more hidden now, too. You have special forces that are doing the things, and they, yeah. you know, it's very convenient for presidents to deploy special forces because uh, it's secret. You can't tell people what they're doing. Uh, between that and drones, it really is kept out of our, of our sight. The only time you see them is if you turn into an NFL game and you see soldiers marching across the playing field. So that's about it, I think. Yeah, it's very hygienic. We're, we're separated from, from the carnage. Uh, I did notice a bit of Orwellian speak in Trump's State of the Union speech the other night. He called on Congress to fully fund, quote unquote, our, our nation's defense. And, and, if, and you certainly remember this. That's an old trick. The Democrats used to always use that because what does that mean? It's meaningless. It, it, it means more. But what, when is any uh, federal program or agency or department fully funded? It's meaningless. Yeah. And that's what's also meaning is this, this idea that the, that the Pentagon has been hamstrung by the so-called sequester, which even <laughs> if it had been implemented like it was envisioned, would have simply slowed down the rate of increase in military spending. You know, this is a great canard. You know, and, and, and Mattis said when he unveiled his defense strategy a, a couple of weeks ago that we've been in a period of strategic atrophy, you know, which is such a bizarre thing when you think about, on the one hand, the military itself talks about how up-tempo its deployments are and how engaged it is everywhere in the world. But he talks about strategic atrophy as if these guys have been sitting around on their hats under the Obama administration mm -hmm which just hasn't been the case. Although there is, as I said on the Liberty Report, there's an atrophy when it comes to strategy because our concept of our strategy of what we should be doing in the world, that has atrophied to a large degree. And there's no amount of military budget that will, that, that will compensate for that kind of atrophy. Isn't it interesting during Trump's speech that now, of course, the Democrats are no better on foreign policy. We all know that. But it's interesting how really since Reagan militarism and support the troops and all this stuff has become a Republican phenomenon, whereas to our grandparents, they would have associated the 20th century wars with uh, Woodrow Wilson and FDR and then LBJ in Vietnam. It's, it's funny how that's turned around and it's become a Republican thing. It's such a great bait and switch, you know, the propaganda among conservatives. If you're conservative, you support war, you support more adventure overseas. It used to be, you know, conservatives, the idea of being a conservative was you realize the government can't run your life. Mm -hmm. It can't run the lives of people here. It's terrible at running the DMV. It's terrible of all these things. But then all of a sudden they place their faith in this same government to go over and run the world in a place where you don't speak the language. We have no idea about the culture. Most of these people couldn't even find it on a map. It's just so preposterous. And unfortunately, they fall in Fort Hook, on and Sinker because this idea that if you don't support the wars rather than just the troops, the, the military, uh, then somehow you're less American and less patriotic. That really, uh, that, that, that really is a worship of the state. Uh, 
uh, and it's really a, not a conservative phenomenon historically. Yeah. Well, I'd like to get into the numbers a little bit, and I think we're going to see that you can be for limited government or you can be for our current foreign policy. You can't be for both. Um, so as, as I'm sure a lot of our listeners are familiar, uh, right now the federal budget is about $4 trillion. You could silo that into so-called mandatory entitlement spending on Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid. That's $2 trillion of it right there. And really, we have about a trillion dollars in overall so-called defense spending. So that's two trillion. So really, you're left with less than a quarter of the budget or about a quarter of the budget is, uh, you know, what is, is remains for the kind of things that the federal government purports to do, things we think they shouldn't do. But in the public's mind, things like schools and roads and farm policy and, and welfare and, and all these things are actually – just this 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 tiny uh, sliver of the federal budget, and the military spending will increase. And you know, there's a, there's a bargain this grand uh, this grand alliance between the Republicans and Democrats. If the military budget increases, the Republicans will often cave on more domestic spending. It's the only way to get these things through. You know, uh, uh, Secretary Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, at the end of uh, this past week, was it was it Greenbrier at the GOP retreat down there, right. and he told them, "Hey, we're going to ask for seven percent more military spending in 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 for 2019 than we did in 2018." And if you remember, Jeff, in 2018, the president first came through with, I think, 680 or 690 billion dollar request, um, which was bumped up, I think, 50 billion. Uh, and Congress said, that's ridiculous. We need to bump it up $50 billion more. So they ended up with $100 billion more than they had initially discussed. And when you talk about this compared to the rest of the world, just that one fifty billion billion bump up that Congress gave the president is the entire military budget of Russia. So mm. that is, it's just a little, that's considered a little bump up uh, for us. Yeah, isn't it interesting how the magic words support the troops uh, becomes an excuse for just unhinged spending of, of money that we're not, we, federal government, is not bringing in taxes. And I will throw this out there, Daniel, as an aside. These congressional trips, like the one of the Greenbrier, yeah, they're not funded by taxpayers. But if you're giving money to one of the, to either the Republicans or the Democrats, to their parties, you're an absolute chump. Because this, the Greenbrier, I've been there. It's, I think, like a $500 a night place. They can go stay at the Days Inn in Anacostia. <laughs> if they want to talk, as far as I'm Unlikely. concerned. But, um, you know, the, ostensibly, f from what I'm reading today, the, the 2018 defense budget, the military budget, is $824 billion. But I know you've argued and talked – we talked about this offline – that there's a lot of hidden uh, def defense spending in, in places like the State Department budget. So talk about that a little bit. Well, certainly in state, you've got Homeland Security. Uh, you've yeah. got a counterintelligence component of the FBI – You've got the Department of Energy that does our nuclear program. Uh, you have the interest on the, the, the war debt, which is a huge chunk of money as well. You've got veterans expenses. Those are related to the cost of our military empire. So when you add it up, it's definitely well over a trillion. And the many, many others have, have, have you know, marked it at well over a trillion dollars a year and rising. Uh, and the question is, what do we get for it? Do we get more security? No, we're told we're even less secure than ever after 16 years, 17 years fighting this war on terror, we're even more vulnerable uh, than ever. So what, where, where does this money go? <laughs> so is the, the appropriation for VA, uh, uh, Veterans Affairs, is, is that separate from the DOD approach? Is that housed elsewhere in the federal budget? Yeah, that's a separate appropriations. Uh, theoretically, you, I know this is gonna, you're, you're going to have a hard time remembering how long ago this was, Jeff, but we actually used to do appropriations on the Hill where you'd go through – uh, each one of these departments and and appropriate the funds. Of course, that's now all gone, and everything is is handled uh, from the center, from the from the speaker's uh, uh, office, and through CRs, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, they, you, we used to go through line item uh, these different uh, uh, requests each year, and veterans was was separate. Well, just think of how many twenty and thirty somethings we now have mm -hmm. who have mental or physical injuries from Iraq and Afghanistan that will require medical care for the rest of their lives. They might live to be in their 90s. And, and of course, with battlefield medicine now, a lot of people survive that might not have survived in earlier wars. It, it's, I mean, has anyone ever done a study of what our future VA costs might look like? 
Well, sadly, the, the fact is, to be quite blunt, the only mitigating factor is that so many of these vets are killing themselves Ugh. still quite young. Uh, oh. You know, ironically and horrifically, there is a big savings there because it's an epidemic of these soldiers. Because the other thing is, you know, Jeff, when these guys go in with PTSD, depression, uh, alcohol addiction, whatever problem, they're not given these sort of long, expensive therapies that they may need. They're given a cocktail of psychoactive drugs that we have know we see over and over again produce terrible results in people. All of these mass shootings, you see these kids are on these drugs. These guys are given a cocktail of drugs and told, go home, take these drugs, and you'll be fine. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it really is uh, not the way to treat these guys and gals. Well, another angle to all this is that these wars are funded using borrowed money, in, in effect, treasury debt. Um, going through the budget, uh, currently the, the interest on the national debt costs Congress in terms of its budget appropriations about $315 billion a year. Um, but we're in a very, very low interest rate environment. So the Fed, uh, by, by targeting and keeping the, the Fed funds rate very low, makes it much easier for Congress to service the debt. But uh, I'm sure a lot of people know that Janet Yellen and, and now Mr. Powell are talking about ra raising interest rates. Um, I read an interesting article in National Review how if we ever went back to the 10 percent interest rates of the uh, um, early Reagan and late Carter era, uh, then with a 10 percent interest rate, that $300 billion a year interest payment would become $2.5 trillion. Wow. So in other words, it would be the single largest item in the federal budget. Now, even with an interest rate far less than that, I don't think the Fed will, are ever going to let us get back to that. But, but assuming just sort of a normal range of 5 to 8 percent interest, I, I just wonder if all of a sudden Congress had to grapple with this gigantic interest payment every year and people could actually see, oh my gosh, we're spending as much on that as entitlements. I wonder if, if that might be a way to wake people up to, to how much we're spending on these wars. Well, Jeff, I mean, uh, I, I don't know if this happened to you. It probably didn't because you're smarter than me, but it reminds me of when I was very young in my early 20s and I got my first credit card and had a great old time. And then all of a sudden I got this bill. <laughs> it hmm. shocked the heck out of me, you know, and I think that might be the case. If, I mean, these things are hidden. Uh, the middle class, uh, the decline in the middle class in earning power, et cetera, et cetera, is all a, a, a part of this hidden budget, this hidden spending. And if it ever becomes apparent, I think they might start asking questions. But who in the mainstream media is even going to bother asking right now or bringing it to their attention? Well, we are hearing a lot about how Republicans don't care about deficits anymore. And, and of course, they never really did. And, and Democrats certainly never did. Um, it looks like the 2018 deficit will be about $666 billion. So we're back into that range of, of half a trillion per year. I, I think it's going to get a lot worse than that. Uh, the CBO, Congressional Budget Office, certainly predicts that it's going to get a lot worse than that under current budget and revenue scenarios. Uh, but let's let's just, for the sake of argument, assume that it holds at about half a billion or a little more per year. That's still a trillion dollars of new debt every two years, five trillion every decade. Uh, you know, it's clearly unsustainable. So the the question becomes then who who will fund our wars? The right right now, the majority of treasury debt is still owned by uh, the Social Security Trust Fund and Americans and individuals. Um, and banks holding treasury debt. I mean, what's the what, what's the end game scenario here? This dovetail between unbridled military spending and deficits. How, how does it play out? And how will it play out in the future? As you as you pointed out at the beginning, you know we have to fully fund. Not only that, we're in the middle of an upgrade of our uh, nuclear. Uh, uh, nuclear weapons capabilities, and that means revamping, basically retooling Los Alamos, Livermore, all of the nuclear weapons labs, bringing them out of mothballs from the Cold War, rebuilding them with modern technology. If anyone thinks this is only going to cost a trillion, you know, you've got another thing coming. So you've got some big bills coming down the pipe if he continues uh, only on the military side. Plus, he said in his State of the Union that he wants a trillion and a half dollars to rebuild our infrastructure. So there's some big spending coming down the road if he if he if he gets what he wants or if he pursues what he claims he wants to pursue.
What what is our nuclear capability? What a what a ridiculous phrase. What does our nuclear capability look like? Do we have lots and lots of active uh, nuclear we- long range nuclear weapons? Pl- plenty enough to 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 blow up the capitals of our so called enemies? Yeah, we have about seven thousand nuclear weapons right now, and they're and you know they're they're they're. <laughs> They're pretty powerful things, but you know the new nuclear posture review is expected to be released sometime this month. And from what others have written about, who've seen part of it, a uh, part of the plan is to uh, start making so-called uh, usable mini nukes and uh, things that can be used on the battlefield, deployed into Western Europe as a deterrent to the Russians. Hmm. Uh, it's a strange concept because it suggests the idea of first strike as a policy rather than mutual assured destruction. And people think mini nukes. Oh, that sounds cute. You know, we'll, we'll, we can use them on the battlefield. Well, a relatively low yield nuke these days is around the strength of uh, the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So yeah. these are some pre- still some pretty destructive bombs. Uh, but it's the new attitude toward nuclear weapons that appears to be coming down. Unfortunately, this is what happens when you when you throw everything in the hands of the generals. Uh, but this idea that we can use nukes that we might threaten to use nukes. And also changing the previous guarantees to non-nuclear countries that we will never attack you with nuclear weapons. That is also expected to be done away with. So there's a big incentive for, for worldwide proliferation if that indeed takes place. Who do you think was behind sticking that crazy language in the State of the Union speech about rebuilding our nuclear capabilities? That Trump, I, I don't, you know, Trump's not coming up with this stuff on his own. Well, you know, to be fair to Trump, this is an Obama policy. Obama is the one who announced uh, toward the end of his second term uh, this trillion dollar plan to revamp the nuclear, uh, you know, the, our nuclear weapons capability. But then again, that just lets you know that really uh, no matter who you vote for, no matter who comes into power, the same would have happened. I'm sure if Hillary were president, she would have probably doubled down on it. Uh, but these policies remain the same because the military industrial complex the think tanks that they fund in the Beltway, the lobbyists that they fund, these things go on and on and on regardless of who's elected. They don't even pay attention to who's elected. You know, Daniel, it was interesting during the State of the Union speech when Trump uh, alluded briefly to China and Russia. He didn't call them enemies or adversaries. I, th- I think he used the term rivals. Was that, t- was that remark telling to you in any way? I think it was. And I think it was a, it was a bright spot in a way. And I think it was a soft peddling of, of Secretary Mattis's new defense strategy, where he went into great detail about how Russia and China are our focus, our main threats. Uh, soft peddling that that was also the only time he used the word Russia and China in the speech. And as a matter of fact, that's one of the things that the mainstream media criticized most about his speech. Where's the Russia bashing? You know, where's the China bashing? Yeah. Uh, what's going on here? So and that was really one of the the better parts of the speech that he didn't obsess about this, uh, about, about Russia and China yeah. gives us a little ray of hope, I think. And he didn't seem to go on and on about Iran either. Um, I didn't hear any sort of new saber rattling. Yeah, he didn't, you know, he, 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 he he's, he's sort of, he's sort of, you know, a, a victim of his own policy. This is the one area where he's been consistent. Uh, he's in a bind because the U S official position is, Okay, we want to go renegotiate a deal that we've already made. You know, it's like you bought a house and, you know, three months down the road, you go back to the to the seller and say, hey, I want you to put a pool in. You know, there Mm -hmm. wasn't a pool in here that I wanted. You know, we've the the world has already agreed on this Iran deal. We've already signed off on it. And he says he wants to go down, go back to it and get Iran to make additional concessions. Who's going to do that? Nobody's going to do that. Uh, They're trying to cajole and worse the Europeans into following. But the Europeans are also reaping are already reaping trade benefits out of the loosening of, of, of sanctions mm. against Iran. I think it's going to be difficult for the U.S. to put uh, to put this genie back in the bottle. Well, give us your take on the situation in North Korea right now, vis-a-vis not only South Korea, but but Trump and his rhetoric. Well, this is another example, I think, of the of the real strategic weakness, the real uh so what was the word we use? The the, uh, the strategic atrophy of the United States, and mm-hmm. that the U.S. is no longer relevant. Which for us libertarians is a good thing. Is no longer as relevant to these uh, to these uh, disputes. Uh, whether it's North Korea and South Korea, whether it's Israel and Palestine, whether it's in Syria, the U.S. because it comes to the table pounding its fists on the table is simply ignored. 
you know, all of the saber rattling, all of the bloody nose strikes that we threatened against North Korea. And here you have the North and South get together, a very productive bilateral meeting. The U.S. wasn't invited. They decided to send uh, athletes to compete in the Winter Olympics in South Korea. They've talked openly about reunification uh, for the first time in ages. So the U.S. is, because it is so bellicose in its approach to the world, it's becoming less and less relevant to the rest of the world. And I think this is particularly important when you think about, Jeff, when you think about uh, the kinds of things that the Chinese and East Asia are doing with the rebuilding of the Silk Road, with trade routes. Uh, these are these are places for commerce. These are places for international trade that are taking to place. And the U.S. is just not invited to participate. I think that at the end is going to come back and haunt us and might really be the final decline of, of, of the U.S. dollar. Well, this is something Dr. Paul used to, to say time, time again, was it, the, the neoconservative foreign policy is what's truly isolationist <laughs> in the sense that it puts us uh, in, not as cooperative friends uh, with, with the rest of the world or trading partners, but, but instead uh, positions us as boss of the world. And I noticed uh, just the other day, the Washington Post, our friend Jeff Bezos announced that he's hiring <laughs> Max Boot <laughs> uh, for some new ideological diversity yeah. at the Washington Post. And, and, and against my better judgment, I looked at the little uh, self-description that Boot has on his Twitter or something. And it was, you know, it was all about the United, you know, I believe the United States has a role to play. I, I mean, you know, isn't it interesting that, that, uh, uh, that, that non-interventionist libertarians like us are, are constantly attacked, e even within libertarian circles. I, I hate to say it sometimes that, that libertarians yeah. are, you know, they're, they're always w ready to compromise on foreign policy and war, and you know, but but everything else is, it, you know, d domestic social stuff is more important. Um, isn't it interesting to you that uh, how, how this flipped? How what would have been seen so much as common sense? Uh, you know, 150 years ago, um, we're, we're now seen as the outliers. And, I, and I, I don't like to admit that, but I think it's true. I think it is true. And I think it is because of the neocons, because, uh, you know, uh, every uh, when you all have a hammer, uh, everything's a nail. And this is their foreign policy. Max Boot is writing on the glories of this new book that he came out, you know, an exercise in navel gazing, how we could have won the Vietnam War, you know, if you'd only killed a few million more or something. You know, this is the kind of person he is. So you have this this great diversity, and, 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 and you're right to call it that, this pseudo-diversity of a right-wing neocon amongst a bunch of left-wing neocons. There are no non-interventionists, uh, uh, even semi-non-interventionists represented on the editorial pages of, 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 the, uh, of the Post or any other major American newspaper. And, you know, there's a lot of criticism that, you know, uh, Dr. Paul and myself and a lot of others tend to go on RT, but literally those are the only venues open to criticize U.S. foreign policy right. to criticize the neocons. Right. It, it just, it just simply no other options <laughs> to do that. That says a lot about our so-called diverse media. And, and of course, state-run TV in the form of public broadcasting is a okay. Um, <laughs> I, I want to wrap this conversation up with a question, uh, not so much about the numbers, but about the size and scope of the U.S. military presence relative to the rest of the world. I know you're, you're much more familiar with how many bases we have in how many countries around the world relative to everybody else. So, so talk about this, this thing we always hear that the United States spends more on defense than the next five or 10 countries combined. And that is a fact, you know, and it's, I would say, uh, not to, to pick on semantics, but more on military expenses than defense. We should spend everything we need to on defense. But yeah, Jeff, it's it, we've got you know estimated thousand bases in eighty countries. Okay, you can Google any map of U.S. bases; they're literally everywhere. They're all through Africa. The entire rest of the world combined has about seventy bases outside of of national borders. So you know we're number one in that. And the question is, first of all, this costs about two hundred billion dollars a year to maintain these bases, to maintain the personnel overseas. And the question is, what is it for? Is it they say it's to project power, to keep open sea lanes, to keep open trade lanes. This whole idea, I don't, I don't need to tell the, you at the Mises Institute, this whole idea that our military's job is to, is to promote trade, to promote the sale of, of U.S. goods and U.S. weapons overseas, really is a socialist, you know, preposterous, preposterous socialist notion. Mm -hmm. uh, but there you, there you have it. That's what we've got. 
Yeah, it, it really is unfortunate. Uh, pe- people who aren't following Daniel, they can find him as the sign behind him says at ronpaulinstitute.org. Uh, there's some other great writers there like Adam Dick and Chris Rossini. Uh, Daniel, what is your Twitter fo- handle at Daniel McAdams? Yes, at Daniel L. McAdams. Um, I, I really encourage you to to keep up with RPI, to get your alternative uh, foreign policy news from RPI, and to follow Daniel on Twitter because he he's an absolutely unbelievable resource. And and what's so sad about this is that there are uh, just endless amounts of money uh, for places like the Brookings Institute and AEI in Washington, D.C. to to promote the same old, same old foreign policy. And, and uh, um, you know, we'd love to see organizations like RPI grow because if there's, if there's one thing that's going to save us and our grandkids, uh, it's getting out of this war mindset in the United States. With that, Daniel, thanks so much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.